Today I need to look at my lithium ion pack. This is a 7S 20P pack which I'm building here in the shed and attached to the front of it is the DIY BMS which has been monitoring the cell voltages for well a couple of weeks now and it's monitoring it on its uh, web interface perfectly well and uh, that web interface is delivered by the Wemos Mini D1, the D1 Mini over there in the top right hand corner which I now have on a nice bracket on the DIN rail. But the bracket for the Wemos isn't the only change. I've also flipped all the packs around. So cell 1 is now down here on the right hand side. Cell 1 is the most negative point which I hadn't decided to do last time but of course a few commenters pointed out perfectly reasonably and perfectly sensibly that cell 1 should be the most negative point because if this becomes a 14s pack well cell 8 cell 9 cell 10 will be more positive than cell 1 so that makes perfect sense so i've switched everything around and i've also put some labels on to make it absolutely clear to myself if nobody else that it now reads from right to left cell 1 to cell 7 or in the uh, diy bms speak ID 24 to ID 30 so hopefully those labels are going to make it really clear for me. I have also moved the baton of wood a little bit higher just so there's enough space to put these packs under that shelf that gives them a bit more protection and leaves me a little bit more space. I am however experiencing one issue. Yes, unfortunately my uh, 3D printed brackets are warping in the unseasonably hot weather we're having here in Britain at the moment. Three weeks of high temperatures and no rain, would you believe it, means those brackets are giving up a little bit. But uh, I have, um, well, redesigned one a little bit, just a minor design change where I've put these uh, extra reinforcements down here so hopefully that will stop that uh, warping quite so much but we'll uh, we'll see these are still pla so perhaps they will warp in the heat but uh, well we'll see now i mentioned that the diy bms is monitoring these cells perfectly well and it is but of course it's not had a lot to do because this pack at the moment isn't being charged or discharged so that needs to change and obviously i'll be solar charging these lithium ion cells so i'll need a few bits to do that now i have a number of solar panels on the roof of the solar shed but for this particular installation i'm going to use two 100 watt monocrystalline solar panels and they're going to be placed in series to give me the voltage i need uh, to charge this 7s pack so obviously i will need some wire to attach my solar panels to the charge controller and this is uh, what is it i think this is awg12 or there or thereabouts good enough for the eight amps that those panels can push at their absolute maximum um so that should be fine but i'll need to be as safe as possible so i'll also use a breaker and this is a dc breaker this is actually a 15 amp dc breaker which is more than i need but is enough to protect the cable so i'll have one of those on the solar input and another one from the charge controller to the battery pack and for the solar charge controller i've gone for my old faithful here the tracer a series from ep ever this is a 20 amp solar charge controller it is true mppt and this has got more than enough grunt for what i need for those 200 watt panels I've been running one of these in the solar shed on a lead acid system for at least a couple of years now so I've found these really reliable. Now I'm sure somebody will ask why haven't you used the Tracer AN series, the replacement for this model, the common negative version because this is common positive uh, rather than the older Tracer A. Well there's a good reason for that. 
and that's because I still can't get the communication port to work properly on the Tracer AN with uh, one of these homebrew um, RS4852 Wi-Fi adapters which uses the ESP8266 and uh, this makes it incredibly easy to get all the stats and information out of the Tracer A and unfortunately due to a software upgrade the Tracer AN doesn't work as well or doesn't work at all at the moment um, with one of these so uh, I've gone back to the Tracer A because I know I can plug all this together and it should work. And the last thing I need is well some way of mounting this to the DIN rail so the 3D printer's been doing overtime recently and I've made these brackets here which hopefully should hold it perfectly well on the DIN rail I guess we'll see. A couple of nuts and bolts and these should work reasonably well hopefully. And I think that works all right. It's just sat there quite happily. Hopefully the heat won't get to those brackets. So now it's just uh, time for a breaker in that gap. And actually that can nicely move up. And uh, this will obviously be the battery uh, breaker here on the battery side. And I'll put a solar breaker on the other side to make it obvious. Hopefully, yeah, that should work. So there we have the solar coming into that positive end of this breaker as it's referred to. The wire comes down the back up here into the solar charge controller and obviously the negative, well I don't need to switch that as well, I'm just going to put that straight in. And now for the battery side I've put a cable in here from the positive of the solar charge controller to the top of this breaker, the least potential point and then we'll put another cable in here and uh, screw that in and that will connect through to the battery bank itself on this uh, ring terminal so that will uh, screw in quite nicely up to that hopefully finally with the negative cable strung under there these will obviously need tidying up that should be it everything is connected all the power is connected to the uh, 7s pack so let's turn on the breaker for the uh, 7S pack, the battery, because we always turn on the battery on a solar charge controller before we turn on any solar. And then we'll turn on the uh, PV, the solar as well, and that seems to be working fine. And uh, you might not be able to see it, but this tracer says the uh, battery pack is sat at 27.2 volts, so a reasonably healthy voltage. Now you can change the charging parameters of many of the EP Ever solar charge controllers um, in the solar station monitor software and you can connect to uh, your charge controller using one of the uh, communication accessories. The USB cable is the cheapest or of course you can make your own. But these settings can also be changed on the MT50 remote meter as well. But rather than do a screencast and look at the software, I've printed out here the, all the names of the various different parameters you can change. Also suggested what I've decided I'm going to do and a few of the uh, default options here in the middle. So the first thing I need to do is change the battery type to user so that I can adjust all these parameters. Flooded, sealed and gel are preset and it means you can't set any of these voltages. So first things first, set it to user battery type and then I prefer voltage compensation mode for my charging mode. I don't trust the state of charge, uh, I don't particularly like that function, so voltage compensation is the way for me and this is a completely pointless parameter here it's just for your own entertainment really but my battery capacity is 50 amp hours so that's exactly what i've set if you've bought the external battery temperature monitor you can adjust the temperature compensation coefficient here um, and i've left it as zero i am going to attach that sensor but i find zero is fine and basically this increases or decreases the uh, these parameters and the charging voltages ever so slightly only a plus or minus three millivolts per degree c per two volt cell because of course this is properly a lead acid solar charge controller and if it's particularly cold or particularly hot it will adjust these charging parameters uh, so not to uh, boil your batteries really is the point of that 
The rated voltage level can be set to automatic, but I've manually set it to 24 volts for my 7S pack. And uh, the boost duration, which we'll come to later on, the boost voltage, but the boost duration is uh, anywhere between 0 and 180 minutes and for now at least I've set it to 120 minutes or 2 hours and the equalisation duration I've set to 60 minutes for the moment. Finally down here we've got all the different voltages and uh, these are all the names and these are taken directly from the solar station monitor software and there are different abbreviations in here it's not brilliantly clear but hopefully I'll be able to explain each one in turn. The over voltage disconnect well I've set that to 29.75 which is a little bit over what I'd like my cells to be charged at 4.25 volts that is a safety feature at what point do we absolutely stop any sort of charging whatsoever well I've set that to 4.25 volts so uh, hopefully that will keep me safe but there is a charging limit voltage here which is um, slightly set below and uh, mine's set to 29.25 which is just under the 4.2 volts per cell so it should never get to more than 4.18 volts per cell but if it does there's a safety function here which will cut it off entirely at 4.25 volts if we get up to that 4.18 volts charging limit well the cells need to drop down to this reconnection voltage here before it'll start charging again so i've set that just ever so slightly lower than the uh, 4.18 volts per cell at 4.17 volts per cell or 29.2 volts overall the equalization charging voltage here is done once every 28 or 30 days i can't remember but i don't suppose it makes a great deal of difference whichever one it is but this is a higher level charge that is traditionally set for lead acid batteries to equalize those internal cells uh, but that setting here is still applied even though i'm using this on lithium iron so i've set that to 29.1 volts or 4.16 volts so every 30 days these cells should get a bit of a higher charge than they do on a normal day as it were and that normal day is the boost charging voltage every day at the beginning of the day it will attempt to get these cells up to this value 28.7 or 4.1 volts per cell and of course the solar charge controller will attempt to hold these cells at this voltage for the period of time mentioned above so my equalization once a month 4.16 volts for two hours and the boost charging voltage which is every day we're hoping to get up to 4.1 volts every day for 60 minutes now of course this isn't really primarily a lithium ion solar charge controller so it doesn't do constant current constant voltage Instead, we keep the voltage constant for a period of time, not until the current gets to a certain level. However, of course, it's not really possible for a solar charge controller to do a constant current, constant voltage charge because it can't rely on the solar panels continually giving a constant current. When clouds go over, it can't do anything at all to maintain a constant current into your battery pack. So constant voltage for a period of time is the best we can do. So when the boost or equalisation charge has finished after that period of time, we then go into float mode. Uh, but it shouldn't go into float mode because I've set the voltage of float mode significantly lower than the boost and equalisation charge. Now, of course, lead acid batteries, typically you charge them beyond their sort of normal resting voltage and then you drop them back to a float charging voltage. They sag naturally. Well, that doesn't really happen with lithium ion. So actually, this float charging voltage should never really kick in. As long as the uh, cells are all sat at 28.7 volts, they're not going to sag to 26 and a half so the float voltage and the float charge should never really kick in boost recon charge voltage should probably never kick in either but that's when we've had a boost we're sat at float but unfortunately the uh, the batteries are still sagging presumably 
because they've got a load on them and then it will try and do another boost yet again if the batteries drop below this level 26 volts in total again in my application with this lithium ion set that should never really happen we then have an under voltage warning uh, level here which is just an indicator on the screen of the EP ever which the battery indicator flashes I believe when we go under this warning level of 23 volts and that actually stays on until we hit the uh, warning reconnection voltage which is 24 volts so when it goes below 23 volts the warning starts and it has to get over 24 volts before the warning clears and much the same with the low voltage disconnect and low voltage reconnect voltage this is where the load is actually turned off at the low voltage disconnect low, uh, voltage level here and then we, the load may turn on again at this point which is 23 volts so if it drops below 22.4 the load goes off and if it then recovers above 23 volts the load can come on again and finally there is a discharging limit voltage which is 20 one volt and I can only imagine that the solar charge controller goes into some sort of power saving mode at that point because the load's already off if it's still dropping and drops below 21 volts or 3 volts per cell uh, well hopefully the solar charge controller goes into some low current mode I've never actually got to that point I've never got past these other safety mechanisms hopefully you won't either I'm pleased with the results here. My 7S20P lithium ion pack is now going to be solar charged by two 100 watt solar panels. Given that on a good day they may produce something close to 200 watts and this pack has roughly 50 amp hours which is around 1.3 kilowatts of energy if I charge them all the way up to 4.2 volts that is. So theory has it, with my MPPT solar charge controller, I could fully charge this whole pack within about 7 hours in the best case. In reality, not only does the sun not shine that continually here in the north of England, but I won't be fully discharging this pack on a regular basis anyway. In fact, I haven't got anything attached to it to discharge it at all at the moment. The charging parameters I've set look good on paper, however I'll monitor how well they work in practice over the coming days and weeks. It won't surprise me if I need to make some adjustments and hopefully my explanation of each of the settings will be useful for some. Anyway, I've managed to set up the uh, EP Ever Tracer A with some solar and I can monitor that remotely with the Homebrew Wi-Fi adapter. I can also keep an eye on the individual cell pack voltages using the DIY BMS web GUI as well. Next I'd like to get the DIY BMS to manage this pack rather than just monitor it and thanks to Colin Hickey that's going to be quicker than I thought. In a recent video he has released his latest version of this open source software which includes an automatic average balancing and a cell charge upper limit. So you can uh, click here to see his latest video and if the DIY BMS is something you are interested in, well I suggest you subscribe to his channel. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video, if you have, give me a thumbs up, subscribe down below, comment if you can and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.